All right, so um, because we don't have the chair and vice chair present, um, as the secretary, I think I call the meeting to order. I'm looking to Tim. And so um, I'm taking item one, call to order and roll call. So um, if everyone can go around and uh, for the roll call, that would be great. Start you go this way. Tim Waters, commissioner. Marsha Martin, <clears throat> commissioner. Commissioner Yabro. Commissioner McCoy. Keith Gallagher, regional manager. Sarah Ray, public safety. Andrew Daniels, county supervisor. Tim Wallace, assistant city, uh, assistant city attorney. Molly O'Donnell, housing director. Um, Perry, commissioner. Oh. Um, Harold Dominguez, um, interim executive director. Now, um, we need, um, basically the way our bylaws are written is that um, we would follow Robert's rules of order, which basically says I need a motion for somebody, um, and Susie can't vote on this one yet, because, or can she? Probably not. Yeah. So of the four, I need uh, someone, I need a motion to have someone run a meeting. <laughs> I, I, I thought move, it was going to be a motion I, to I move, uh, I think the mayor contacted you. Mm -hmm. uh, I move that uh, uh, Commissioner, yes, she was out. Uh, Commissioner Yarborough <laughs> uh, be our uh, chair for this meeting. Chair pro tem. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. <laughs> now, I'm turning it over to you, and I'm probably, I think it'd be best if I slide over by you for this. <laughs> if we can get a motion, um, uh, Chair Yar Yarborough, if we can get a motion to allow um, Commissioner Hidalgo Ferry to participate in the meeting. Probably. If you could ask for that motion, then we can go from there. And I'll just Is the motion uh, to suspend the rules? Mm -hmm. Suspend um, Suspend by reference Council Rule of Procedure 25.2A2 to, to allow for, in this case, I move we suspend the rules and allow Commissioner Hidalgo Ferry to participate virtually. Second. Second. Really? That was um, Commissioner Waters. And second by uh, Commissioner um, Martin. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Um, second on the agenda Aye. is to uh, agenda. Oh, we're going down. We're not. Oh, agenda revisions. Yeah. Okay. Um, agenda. Are there any revisions or submissions of documents? No. Yeah. Okay, and we'll move on to item number three to review and approve of the October 17, 2023 minutes. Can I have a motion? I move that, that we approve the October 17, 2023 minutes as presented. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Uh, Susie, I couldn't hear you say aye. Aye. Thank you. Um, the motion was made by Commissioner um, McCoy and second by Commissioner Waters. Um, and that I do have to say that it was it was yeah, passed, passed unanimously. Unanimous. Passed unanimously with. I say that they're absent, yeah. so it's not unanimous. Well, it passed unanimously with. Uh, Chair John Peck and Vice Chair Rodriguez asked. Okay. Thank you for saying it. Appreciate it. Do I have to say it again? I think we're good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, item number four. Um, is there anyone um, here, public invited to be heard, that would like to speak this evening? Uh, seeing there are none, let's move on to item number five. Um, old and new business. We can take item A. Um, so the first item tonight is the 2024 <coughs> utility allowance schedule. And this is something that you review and consider annually if the, the 
prices change, the utility average costs change, um, well, greater than 10% in one category or another. So water did go up this year when we did our joint study with Boulder County. And so um, what you see here is the revised utility schedule for our, our voucher programs for 2024. Just need a, a motion on this resolution. I'll move resolution 2023-41. Uh, Second. All right, is there, um, that resolution was moved by Commissioner Waters and second by um, Commissioner McCoy. Is there any discussion on this? No? So can I, um, all those in favor, say aye. 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 That motion was um, passed unanimously with our Chair Peck and um, Mayor Pro Tem Rodriguez absent. Okay. Moving on to resolution 2023 42. Great. So, um, this is the second amendment to the IGA with the city for the locally funded voucher program. Um, so, just as small background, in 2021, we started this program through the city's human service agency funding, um, and it provides uh, vouchers to about 15 households that um, are um, exiting homelessness through the coordinated entry system. And um, we have been successful using that program now for two years. They, there's enough funding to get through 2023, but this is a time extension on the IGA between the city and the LHA. So towards the end of 2024 is when you'll see a proposal for what to do with this program beyond that in terms of funding. But this is just a time extension. Second. Great. Um, we had approval. Um, the motion was made by Commissioner Martin and seconded by Commissioner Waters. Is there any discussion on this? Seeing none, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Great. Wonderful. Aye. <laughs> <laughs> that motion, motion, um, was passed unanimous, unanimously with uh, Chair Peck and um, Mayor Pro what is he? Vice, Vice Chair, Chair. Um, Rodriguez absent. <laughs> now resolution 2023-43. Okay, this item is um, the executing the IGA for an ARPA funding delegation from the city to complete the accessibility project. Um, so, the as city council, you approved this IGA back on November 14th to fund $64,500 to finish the concrete ramp work that we're trying to do across LHA properties for accessibility reasons, which also helps satisfy the LHA's commitments to the um, voluntary compliance agreement. Um, and I actually wanted to show a quick update on our progress on that while we're on this item. And of course, I'm doing a PDF because we cannot figure out what is going on with this computer and the fonts in PowerPoint. So let me share this. So we've been working really hard on these capital projects. Um, there's a couple more CDBG projects in here too, but basically between CDBG and ARPA, we've had a significant investment in LHA properties this year, but really all this work was completed in the the last, I would say, quarter three and four of this year. Um, and I just want to share our progress because all the work is complete with the exception of security cameras, which we're working with the city on the, the longer term effort there. Um, this is regular CDG funds. We completed the, plat the playground project at the Aspen Meadows neighborhood. So here's our before pictures. They actually look quite good, but um, in reality, they were uh, caution taped off because it was a safety hazard. So our brand new playground is in place and being heavily utilized by the kids. We have, um, includes all new base all the way around as well. Um, so this was a $25,000 and change investment. There's wood chips in the base. Those are our wood <coughs> chips, yes. And then we did the Hover Crossing parking lot project. And this was a $56,000 investment to resurface the whole parking lot and upgrade the ADA parking. Um, 
and it was completed, but here's my photo. <laughs> we have, don't have my photo in place. <coughs> and so that did not come in in time and I just realized now. So I apologize about that, but I'll share it after the fact. But it's a it's new paper, so it's very exciting. <laughs> um, for our ADA compliance projects, we use CDBG CV funds for a total of $145,000 investment. We created sensory units at all of these properties, um, virtually almost every one, except for the Aspen Meadows Senior that had theirs installed at the, the big rehab. So those are units that are accessible for those with um, vision or hearing impairments. Here's, this is, it's not very exciting to see because it's really just electric, uh, mechanical, but it's there, complete. Um, we did accessibility and parking improvements at a bunch of locations as well, including the two commercial um, um, properties. And so that again is very exciting on site, but in, in the photos, it's this was a non-ADA compliant ramp and now we have ADA compliant ramps all the way through. Um, this one was actually the most egregious here because that was sticking out into the into the aisle, which is a definite no-no. So we have an entire new ramp and we actually restriped the um, parking because we had to move everything over. And so I will say on 615 Main, that is something that we did before the sale too, so that we can convey, especially to a um, organization that serves the disabled, a property that um, meets ADA. So we have within the last day, um, actually last night we got certification from our ADA consultant that all the improvements that we've done at the building, including in the restrooms and inside, are all now, the building is fully compliant with ADA. Um, and we closed on a sale this afternoon. Yay. So that is complete. Congratulations. So that's just a little end of year recap on all the grant funding work that really has been a partnership between all HCI staff and LHA staff a bunch of people involved to make sure that this all happened. Ties to our voluntary compliance agreement, which we're also um, actively working to um, report as many improvements complete as possible. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing. And that's the completion of this item. I move then resolution 2023-43. Second. Right. Um, so that motion was made by um, Commissioner McCoy and seconded by Commissioner Martin. Um, is there any discussion? All right, seeing none, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Great. Um, the motion was passed unanimously without uh, Chair Peck and Vice Chair Rodriguez. All right, moving on to resolution 2023-44. Okay, so this item is have a long and storied history, but um, the 6th Avenue Plaza, including that area of parking um, just south of Village Place and that near the spoke, um, that when the Village Place Apartments building was constructed, the original developer back in 1988-89 um, worked with the city and LDDA and they used the plaza as part of their open space requirement and some other things and parking requirement. So there was a maintenance agreement back in 1889 to, 1989, <laughs> 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 um, to just outline who does what in the plaza and the parking. So that, that agreement is long null and void since LHA purchased that property in 2005 um, and then put it into the new partnership that was Village Place. And so as we go into the resyndication, the investors wanted to have something that is actually being followed because it was not, everything that was in there was so out of date that it wasn't even what was actually happening on the ground. And so um, we- We weren't in compliance with that agreement because when the city converted the parking to public parking, mm -hmm. it basically threw everything out of whack because um, LHA had a lot of responsibilities, but it was in exchange for having dedicated parking, parking spots. And so 
and it was the bane of everyone's existence for a few years based on the um, gazebo and many other things. So between LDDA, Fourth Street Division, LHA, streets, so who's who's doing what? So that this or this uh, IGA now outlines that very clearly, and who's responsible for every piece of maintenance in that area. Um, and this is something that the investors wanted for the new village on Main, just to make sure they knew what we were uh, responsible for and paying for. The only thing LHA pays for and will pay for is consistent before and after is the water utilities used to. Um, irrigate the several planters in the plaza because the irrigation system is connected to the building. We have no way of splitting off um, which water goes there versus elsewhere. So that's the only financial commitment of the LHA other than staff responsibilities, which are kind of looped into our general work without having a separate cost. In, in a nutshell, we have LHA maintenance staff that were trying to trim trees. It wasn't safe when they were doing it. So generally, LHA is going to take care of the sweeping, the cleaning, removing the leaves, the water, and forestry will take care of tree trimming, parks will deal with some of the plantings, plantings, and then the GID fund associated with streets will actually be the maintenance on the parking area. So as city council, this is a no-cost IGA officially, so uh, Mayor Peck would end up signing on the city side, but it wouldn't be coming to a public meeting. So this is your, this is the, the body decision here. I move uh, resolution 2023-44. Second. Okay. We have um, a motion to move um, resolution 2023-44 by Commissioner McCoy and seconded by Commissioner Waters. Any discussion or any questions, Susie? If no, seeing none, okay. all those in favor say aye. 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 Okay, that resolution was um, passed um, unanimously and with the absence of Chair Peck and Vice Chair uh, Rodriguez. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, moving on to resolution 2023-45. So this is the revised property tax exemption partnership policy. This will be your second revision since 2021 when we first put this new policy into place. Um, the revision was prompted by income averaging, be coming forward as a common use of light tech and then having two projects propose that here in Longmont soon after. And so what the red lines are showing in the policy is ways to make income averaging projects um, qualify for the tax exemption. And really what we said there is, yes, the whole, you know, all units 80% and below could qualify for the tax exemption if there is a sufficient number of 30% units included, because that's the trade-off, the 30 for 80. Um, that was the basic change, and then we ran this through the advisory board, and they we have some new banking experience, or um, somebody with banking expertise on there, and just a couple of lessons learned over the past year, and there, so there are a couple other red lines in here just to make some things very clear and plan for the future um, for when a project Let's say they get their tax exemption, but they make it through their 15 years, and then and then what? Um, so you'll see in here a couple of changes to that. The application fee is proposed to be lowered, but cover the actual legal expenses that LHA incurs to become a special limited partner on these deals. Um, it, before it was the $5,000 application fee was intended to cover whatever work LHA staff did, plus our legal fees to get on, this would be more, the 2000 is really covering staff, um, and then it is the true legal cost, because we can see those be much, be much higher than 5000 in some instances, so we wanted to make sure we weren't coming out on a loss. Um, and then the ongoing maintenance fee also was proposed to be raised from 1000 to 3000 so that um, that really, 1,000 is, is not that much in terms of staff time 
for the level of monitoring that we see coming out of the agencies. So those are the proposed changes to the property tax exemption policy. I'm hoping that this one sticks and we don't have other changes where we have to do more revisions soon, but um, it should be very ready to go and it's informed by two years of projects by now, so. Um, I move approval. Okay. Um, resolution 2023-45 is approved by Commissioner um, Martin and seconded by Commissioner Waters. Any questions, discussions? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Um, aye. Wonderful. That was unanimous. Um, with Chair Peck absence and Vice Chair Rodriguez absence. Okay, moving on to resolution 2023-46. I'll open it up and then you can fill in the details later on. Um, so as part of the ongoing effort that we've been doing with the LHDC to determine if they would be transferring their assets to LHA, um, we've already determined that they're going to stay on and specifically for Fall River because that one would it was not advantageous to exit LHDC from that um, but the other two uh, projects that we would need to take some action on are Spring Creek and Christman 1. So this one is specifically regarding Christman 1 and it comes out of that effort. Um, as an interim measure because Christman 1 was set up as an S-Corp a corporation, generally a corporation. Um, we don't exactly know why, but it is a taxable entity. And we haven't had to pay tax so far, but now that we are getting revenue from Christman 1 in accordance with our agreements with FGL, um, we needed to either take some action or pay taxes this year. Um, and so this is an administrative services agreement between LHA and Christman Development, which is the entity um, that LHDC primarily holds in Christman 1. And if we set up this administrative services agreement, then LHDC can pay LHA for the staff time that we've used and have been using to administer this project, especially on the finance side. Um, and if so, then they have expenses in, that can offset the income and we wouldn't be subject to paying taxes. So this is an interim measure before we remove LHDC from the Christman 1 entity and transfer it fully to LHA. And at that point, we'll get rid of the taxable entity and make it an LLP like every other property is. Did I get it? <laughs> yeah. All right. So that's what this is. Who governs the yes <clears throat> court? It's, it's wholly owned by LHDC. It's a subsidiary, and so it's governed by, by LHDC. Yeah. And it, did LHDC set it up as an escort? I think what happens in, in some of those cases, um, the actual entity, so Christman Park, uh, Christman, required it to be. The investors at the time? It's, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's required to be. So I don't know that it can be changed, technically, um, because it might have been required because and then of the tax credits. Why have we not had to pay, or LHDC not had to pay taxes since it's in session? Because they only they haven't been getting money, so it's so there was just, nothing to tax. Yeah, so there's a lot of the times it's just sits there, um, and and you don't make any money. But with Christmas, it's a, it's a whole different ballgame. We are actually receiving revenue for that. This starting this year. Is it actually um, profitable, or is it? Um, well, it it usually takes them a couple years. So they opened in what twenty. The entity was created in 2018, so it should have been some time after that. Um, and it takes them a while. They, they pay off a lot of debt and developer fee first, so it takes a few years to really stabilize and start having a normal income without those large expenses up front. So that's what we've seen. And so this is our first year with actual income. So, you know, it, it being technically a nonprofit operation, it shouldn't be, it shouldn't have a huge uh, net, correct? So it's officially a profit 
Yeah, I understand. For profit, the but they, is, yes. is it for profit? The money, all the income generally gets turned around into just operations. But, There's no profit to tax. Yes, mm -hmm. but because they're required to pay LHA a, a piece of their, a, a percentage, correct? Yeah, so it's kind of a waterfall effect. Mm -hmm. So they have a huge waterfall when they, when they sign it. It'll say, you're paying the developer piece first, and they pay all the developer mm -hmm. fees. Then it'll come down and say, you're going to pay the limited partners this percentage, and so forth. So we're getting to that part where they're getting further in the waterfall and having to make those payments. As they get more income in, that's not consumed by expenses in that year. So the motion was made, right? So there's a motion right there. No, there's no motion right there. Okay, so. And I'll move approval of resolution of 2023-46. Second. Um, we have approval for resolution 2023-46 by Commissioner Waters and seconded by Commissioner McCoy. Uh, is there any other discussion on this? If not, um, all those in favor say aye. 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 All right, that motion was uh, approved unanimously uh, with the absence of uh, Chair Peck and Vice Chair Rodriguez. On to item G, right? Yeah, I'll take that one. Okay. Uh, so, commissioners, uh, as you recall, in your role as city council, we presented uh, the city's parental and caregiver leave policy. Um, when we began uh, the bringing the housing authority in to the city structure, um, the housing authority adopted all of the city's personnel policies. Um, as we were moving through this, um, we just need a motion from the commissioners to adopt the new policy that we have, which is the parental and caregiver leave policy because it wasn't covered under the original decision in adopting those policies. Because LHA is not covered by FMLA because they have less than 50 employees. So LHA has a separate two week parental leave right now, which would be replaced by the city's parental and caregiver leave if we tonight make that motion. Starting and January 1st. If we don't adopt it. Not that I'm thinking about it, but. I just uh, then LHA that. would con continue to get two weeks of, of parental leave, not caregiver at all, because that's yeah. not covered on the current policy. Um, and then, I mean, in, when you're thinking about these are employees working side by side, they would be working with mm -hmm. half of us in the room would have the city's access to the city's six weeks, mm -hmm. and half in the room would have the LHA access to LHA's two weeks. And I think the big issue, you know, many of the reasons why we brought it forward on the city side is, A, it's more consistent in organizations to see this type of policy, especially on the parental side. What's unique about what we've done is we've added the caregiving component to this. Um, and that's a product of many of us in the organization being put in that situation at times. And I think that would become a recruitment issue when we're looking at staff if we don't have that in place. Mm -hmm. And um, as we know, um, you know, having that time off, whether you're adopting, fostering children to, to you know, it's important on the other side, um, you know, with aging parents, a lot of us are in a position of, we have to deal with those issues. So I think retention is a big piece of this and recruitment. Sure, and, and actually I was not approving, disapproving of the policy, but wondering what the impact on existing budgets was going to be. I think when we look at the on the financial side, um, in most cases, um, we haven't seen a lot of doubling up. Um, I think there may be some minimal um, need for uh, revenue if we needed to hire temp positions, but in most cases, we're covering with existing staff um, operations, so it's not like it cre creates an additional cost. There is a productivity cost that you deal with that we've been managing through those issues. I move the, that we adopt the, the city's parental and caregiver leave policy. Second. 
Okay, that motion was um, made by Commissioner McCoy and seconded by Commissioner Martin. Um, any other discussions before we approve? Seeing none. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Um, that motion was passed unanimously with in the absence of uh, Chair Peck and Vice Chair Rodriguez. Now we're moving. Commissioner Yarbrough, we might have one comment that just oh, for clarity, sure. it might be worth um, doing another motion to eliminate this LHA's existing policy just to be clear that we're replacing them instead of adding, just adding. Okay. I, I move that we replace the existing uh, policy uh, and replace it with the, the city's uh, uh, rental and caregiver leave policy. Second. Right. That, mo that motion is that amendment to the first motion or just? You can just treat it as any motion. Okay. The motion was uh, made by Commissioner McCoy and seconded by Commissioner Water. Um, all of those, what did I say again? Um, All of those in favor, yeah. <laughs> say aye. Um, aye. 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 Okay, that motion was approved with the absence of Chair um, Peck and uh, Vice Chair Rodriguez. Moving on to item H. So LAG staff is proposing to change and increase um, fees paid by the applicants and residents beginning in 2024. First one being the application fee. We've been charging $25 application for the new applicants coming into the buildings or the properties. Um, our fees changed in 2023 when we changed reporting companies. Um, so following House Bill 19-1106 uh, that we are allowed to actually charge up to our actual costs that we incur. So we would like to raise those fees to $50 per adult household member. Second fee is the late fee. We've been charging a $25 late fee on the 8th of the month. It's not encouraging residents to stay in compliance because if they're late, they only had to pay $25 even if they pay their rent on the 30th of the month. So we would like to um, come into compliance, um, sorry, we'd like to follow the requirements of Senate Bill 21-173, raise that to $50 on the 8th or 5%, whichever is greater of their lease. And then the third one is raise our current security deposit from $500 up to $1,000. Because in many cases, the security deposit is not even covering or making a dent into the damages we are seeing in units. I'll add on that. There's a lot of resources out there for security deposits. Our center helps. Faith organizations help. A um, work. Human service agency mm -hmm. funding through uh, special arrangements. A woman's work, he said. Um, Senior services. So those are often utilized by residents. Um, so. Is that a legitimate use of our affordable housing fund? Um, our health and human service funding. Yeah. Help me with Well, part of our affordable housing fund is to help people secure housing. So we have used CDBG funds for security deposit programs in the past, but we have not to date used the affordable housing fund. What's the question? Oh, okay. Yeah, could be used. Yeah, could be. Mm -hmm. It is serving low-income residents. Um, we have to dig into that a little bit, I think. I think on the surface it would meet the intent. Mm -hmm. I think we've tried to use other funding sources which we should before they gain into it. But, but I, I could also, given the, given the list that Molly just ran through, we know the pressures on Warren's right. work and every other nonprofit in town right now. Um, and to have as a backup, if, if need be, somebody who is desperate and doesn't have a thousand dollars but needs housing and is a would satisfy, clears the criminal background check, satisfies all the other requirements. I'd hate to have that right. be the basis for somebody surf couch surfing uh, if, if the affordable housing fund could be used as a backup. So. so what we would do if we ever considered that, um, it would be included in our annual action plan as a set aside for that, so that council would review and approve the amount set aside. Um, and then 
implementation, either, I don't know if it's direct or to to a nonprofit to provide those, something like that was probably, would be necessary. Yeah, I mean, it seems like you would want it to be uh, the last resort, yeah. um, because, you know, it's probably easier to apply to than to go around town, so it wouldn't want it to be first, become the first resort. Um, this, I, I suspect that we could leverage those funds more successfully in other ways and get more bang for the buck. So we can Yeah, let us dig into it, but I think that's something that we can bring back to the city council as part of the affordable housing fund and maybe allocate a small amount that if people are unable to get assistance from other organizations, they can apply for this type of funding. But they would have to show proof that they've sure. exhausted all their opportunities. Mm -hmm. And so let us take that and we'll bring it back to the we'd actually have to bring that back to the city council to take action on that. And um, I think it'd be better if we found a way to operate to operationalize it internally versus adding a burden to someone else and then getting charged for that. And I'm thinking that it would not make sense to delegate those funds to the LHA because we don't want the LHA to get mixed up no. in people's security deposits. Yeah. So they would come to HCI mm -hmm. and then HCI would have to fill the void similar to our center, but it would be last resort and proof that they've gone to the other agencies. Would it be a pain to have them to have uh, pay since they're used to or know that originally it was five hundred dollars to make like a payment plan, or it's five hundred dollars down um, at the sign of your lease and then five hundred down, you know, maybe no. We we've had a lot of issues with commentary notes and not getting paid. Yeah, I'll talk about that. Mm -hmm. On some HCV issues. Another option could be LHDC money to create funds specifically for security deposits. Mm -hmm. and, and that's a different issue too because we do have to, on the LHDC side, figure out we need to start taking in donations next year um, to, to maintain our tax status, um, or to maintain the status as a nonprofit. And so we have talked about creating. Um, accounts within the LHDC that can receive donations either for tenant service, you know, the support activities that we do, we could create another one that said you can donate to this account for security deposits as well. And that would work to help us solve that issue with um, our nonprofit status there. Well I certainly understand the rationale for the for the recommendation. I just wouldn't you think about low barrier entry, right, to, uh, to those services that people need. I think for that, if somebody checks all the other boxes, to be the barrier to keep somebody on the street. If, if you remember with the, um, uh, Xenia, and one of the recommendations that, that I made with the ARPA funding and the interest that we've earned from that is we did set aside 50,000 for, um, for the deposits because that was going to require it. And, and so as we see it, we can work on setting up different programs. Most of those will come back to you all as a city council. You know, what, we, what I'm thinking of it, if we created it in LHDC, with the funding coming over, the council said we want to set aside $10,000 for deposits with the city donating the money to LHDC also that would count as a yeah. I mean, they, they donate yeah. CDBG and, and ARPA and all that so but will that meet the definition of a donation for the tax status because I believe so I have a meeting with the tax account to okay. just to make sure that we're in compliance with how LHDC is set up so it's two problems yeah that may be the easy answer and then if we say we're seeding it then work with like Community Foundation and other areas to try to get funding more for people. I will say that um, I know that the increases are warranted in thousand dollars. I'm a renter, so 
is nothing because you got to pay first month's rent, last month's rent as your deposit and a deposit on top of your first and last month's rent. So if your rent like you know over two thousand dollars a month, guess how much that is? You know, so five thousand dollars just to get in to sign a lease. So um, I think thousand dollars is pretty generous, but we also don't want to hinder or make it more challenging for people who are really struggling, truly struggling, and have more, and may feel like they don't have more options. So, um, so I do appreciate that too. But I do also want um, the other commissioners who are homeowners may not know how much it costs out there because it's it's hard out here in these Longmont streets. I'm just saying. It's a lot of, it's a lot of cash up front. It is. It is. And so you have to say, you know, that was one of the reasons why I was asking about the down payment. And I know you're going to talk about that later in the report, mm -hmm. but you know, if you say like, oh, if my landlord said it, I could put 2,500 down, sign the lease, move in, and pay the other 2,500 next month, that would be feasible for me than coming up with 5,000. Well, heck, I let me save five more thousand and have some more money to put on towards a condo or something. You know what I'm saying? But that's what's, I mean, that's what's out here right now. It's a quarter at least of what somebody might be down for a down payment on. on actual purchasable home. Yeah. Well, I'll move approval of the application of the uh, fee adjusting policy on fees, both um, security deposits and, and applications. Second. All right. Um, that motion was made by Commissioner Waters and second by Commissioner uh, Martin. Um, all those in favor say aye. 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 Um, just add, I, if I was going to be here, I'd put in my paper file a question about a quarter from now. Where are we with that? So, I hope somebody does that. Just to make certain we close that. Loop. I'm thinking out, uh, hopefully, we can get this figured, figured out in the next month or two because we do need to figure out on the LHGC side this donation piece. I mean, that's imminent, and I think those two will work well with each other. That motion was passed unanimously without, uh, in the absence of our Chair Peck and Vice Chair Rodriguez. Um, moving on to item I, 5I. I'll be taking this one. So um, there's no question up for consideration tonight, but I did want to make kind of more of a special presentation to you all about all that we have figured out about how solar, solar, photo, solar photovoltaic work on LIHTC projects. So I wanted to share that with you tonight because we're at the juncture where we're making some big decisions on this and I wanted um, your board to understand kind of the background. Um, and you may be seeing something coming through on the city council side in the next month um, between LHA and LPC about this too. Uh, power issues. So Village on Main, we are moving forward with solar photovoltaic on the roof. Um, here, look how many of the panels there are. It's gonna be completely covered. Um, really, here's the case study we have. So first of all, Village on Main was not a purpose-built LIHTC property. So it has 73 individual meters. Um, when LHA bought it, everything just stayed the same. So LHA still pays all the utility bills on behalf of the residents now that it is LIHTC, but there are 73 individual meters, which means 73, every month, 73 meters are read by Longmont meter readers. Um, that results in $14,000 a year just in meter read fees, which is an LHA operational cost that we could certainly use for better purposes. Um, and LHA pays about $45,000 annually in utility costs on behalf of the tenant and the house, the house meter. So we analyzed two different size systems, a 100 kilowatt systems, keeping the individual meters um, because master adding a master meter to a electrical room that already has 73 meters on the wall is actually a true challenge. Um, how do we eliminate them, bring in the new one or tie them together or there just wasn't enough space, frankly, on the wall. Um, and so we analyzed this system it would have covered 41% of the usage of the building. Um, we'd still have those meter fees that are not really necessary. Um, it would lower our costs though, annually on utilities. 
it would take about 11 years to um, essentially pay back the cash investment that we would have to put in to put the system on uh, through those, those solar offset savings. And so we would expect to get 30% tax credits if we did it this way for the solar only. Um, and so that would leave us with a $150,000 bill after the fact. We also looked at doing the maximum size system we can do, which is 165 kilowatts, converting to a master meter, and this would cover 69% of our usage. Uh, the metered fees would reduce dra drastically. Um, our utilities would reduce down to just over $22,000 per year. So we're, um, it's about a 45% offset. Um, the cost of the system, if we got 30% tax credits, which is what we would definitely assume, um, would be $255,000 but we're actually working with our tax accountants to apply for a 50% tax credit. It's a special new program. Nobody's really gone through it yet. We're gonna be one of the first in the country, um, but if we are successful, then the cost of the solar, the, the materials and uh, uh, electrical configuration be down to 166, and then we would pay that back you know, 16 years, so basically, this, the solar savings after 16 years would have paid for itself and then we're free and clear. Um, so we ended up going with 165 kilowatt system. This has been months of work between LHA, the development team, and LPC to figure this out and what we're ending up doing is putting a master meter and now we're getting technical and Harold might correct me. Master meter in front of all the individual meters without removing them all because um, it's gonna be actually cheaper and easier. This was an LPC idea. They were, our development team was blown away at how helpful LPC was in coming up with this because they're used to Excel. <laughs> um, and so then we could also still, we could submeter if we wanted to just to monitor usage and be able to see what's going on on a unit by unit basis. But you'd have to pay if we meet or if we read them yes but the option exists if we needed to for some reason well, and Andy could look into the future you may not necessarily need LPC to read them but the technology is there to create the submeter for the resident to look at and how we can communicate with the residents when we um, are moving to 100% renewable and needing to reduce usage there's a different blend with some other metering technology, but we at least have a platform there. Are you going to replace the submeters uh, with no. smart meters, or are you just going to leave them the old digital? Old we're just going to leave them the old because we're doing the, the master meter would be a smart meter. Mm -hmm. And that's the actual functioning one. Mm -hmm. And um, you don't take people down with electricity when you're trying to, in this that way, was the, literally. The wire the box in and connect it so it's a small outage versus. We were about to be talking temporary relocation for four days while we had the building shut off and it was gonna be a big yeah. effort. Um, that was actually the thing that said, okay, you're doing this, is that we were able to avoid that. Um, LPC is, is interested in contributing some capital funds to the installation of the electrical configuration system. We're fine tuning the number, but that is something that they would propose to council in the future if it comes to fruition, we're working through the details, which would be amazing. Um, and that's part of the, the learning, I call it our learning lab right now of what we're doing, because everything we're learning on the LHA projects when we're doing it, collectively actually allows us for private sector units where we can say, here's our experience, here's how we're doing it, here's the roadmap to doing this. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, what we're finding is when people are bringing it, it's, it's a bit of brain damage to go through it, and the more we can set examples of how to do it, I think the easier that's going to be on future development projects in the market rate world. Yeah, um, that's a lot of solar panels and therefore a lot of potential access on a Sunday day. Is, yeah. is there any... Uh, hmm? I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. We don't think there's a lot? Um, we have, our modeling shows that we will 
produced enough to cover 69% of our usage with the full system. Yes, but not, yeah, on average, which is the, which is the question because the, the average is, is not the daily and we have uh, um, uh, with, with that much solar generation capability, you have a, a, pot a lot of potential for peaks moving, demands moving, load shifting, that kind right, of thing. Right, right. So is there any, has there been any consideration of adding some storage to the installation uh, to use it as a distributed energy resource? So that's tying into the conversations that we're having about putting storage at some of our um, substations. Um, oh, so you would route the access to, to, the, to charge the, the substation, um, adding the, the battery component on our YTEC project becomes challenging from a cost perspective. But that's the conversation I've been having with Platte River and mm -hmm. Daryl and David about the battery storage that they're bringing in so that when it is generating excess energy, they can charge the batteries at the substation. Karen, yeah. you referred to this as your learning lab. I, I'm gonna, I trick that translates for me into R and D. I mean, that's what you're doing here. Mm -hmm. And and um, and as you learn your way forward, you're marking the trail for others to follow. Correct. Don't go here. This is what we learned. Mm -hmm. This is a path that gets you to this outcome. And and this is a pretty good use in my mind of tax dollars, both to accelerate learning mm -hmm. and to produce the kind of outcome that increases efficiencies and reduces costs, you know, for residents and everybody else. But I, I just think, I think it's a great example. I think we ought to, I've, I've, we've had this conversation before. I think there are tons of opportunities. If we frame right. whatever the it is, moving forward as an R&D opportunity, right? Mm -hmm. and, um, and how do we want to codify what we've learned? And, I, and I'll stop there. Well, that's actually a good point. Um, I've had this conversation with um, Commissioner Martin as well. You know, when we brought a cent over to um, Chapa, and we talked about it being 100% electricity, they were actually a little skeptical of that. And in terms of, you know, they're asking questions about cost of construction, what does this really mean? And what Molly, what some of the team didn't know is I was getting kind of briefed occasionally on this. It really let me explain to the Chaffa board the overall goal of moving to 100% renewable energy to 2030, the fact that we have our own electric utility and our own generation unit who are engaged in these conversations with us in terms of how, how we're using this to, to again, do the same thing, R&D so that we can prepare others. So, um, and that actually was something that they responded really well to when they understood the broader partnership. Our next case study might back up why they were skeptical. Let's, which I'll be able to show you why most developers might say that, but then it doesn't come to fruition. So we'll go over that. Um, so in the two case studies that I'm gonna show, Village on Main and Minnesota, it's a, two different worlds solar and light tech playing together on existing buildings versus new builds. So on existing buildings, um, in LHA's portfolio, we already are master metered on all of the senior properties and our hotel conversion, which is the suites, but if there was another hotel, they're generally master metered as well. Well, they're definitely master metered. Nobody pays utilities on their hotel room. Um, and then for PSH, permit support housing, it also makes sense because the utilities are our struggle for, for those exiting homelessness. Um, and then on the individually metered side in our portfolio, we have Village Place, which was not originally Litech purpose built, and um, townhomes and walk-ups are less efficient to master meter than a traditional mid-rise building. AMN is individually metered where the tenants pay utilities and walk-ups, which we don't have any currently, but you'll see that come back in a cent. So really it's kind of talking about, and I'm trying to show here is on existing buildings, when does it make sense for LHA to convert to a master meter, which now the only project, uh, only property remaining where that will be an option will be AMN. Um, and why does master metering work on our other buildings? And then does it make sense to add in solar if you already have the master meter infrastructure? 
So <coughs> it does, because it does lower the LHA operational costs since we're already paying the utilities anyway. Um, some might say there is an argument out there that when you master meter, it's less incentive for the actual resident to monitor their own energy conservation, but there's that's not necessarily fully proven and also on a master meter without some metering you can't really decipher. But um, there is a cost to convert the electrical configuration when you're talking about going from an individual to a master meter. Um, so there is a cost uh, implication that you have to be ready to pay for. Um, and yes, it will take, you will get your investment back. It will take 11 to 16 years of what we've seen. So these are just kind of the, how we're figuring out all of the nuances of how solar plays with LIHTC on our existing buildings. So those of be those that um, when we go through this resyndication rehab process again. So we get to ascent, and I'm in a PDF. Oh, good, you can't see the whole thing. So here's our, our proposed solar PV layout on ascent. Um, it's a 200 and kilo. Oh, I did want to mention before I get here the spoke right down the road from, from Village on Main, the identical size of units for both 73 units. We are proposing a 165 kilowatt system, and the spoke put in a 41 kilowatt system that covers about 16% of their energy usage, and we are going to cover 69%. So I just wanted to make the distinction that we are really putting in the commitment to this, in the work, and the, the dollars to get the outcome. So then when you consider that, that scale, we're going to put a 211 kilowatt system at a cent because it's such a larger property, it would offset 45% of the energy usage, but that's pretty much the maximum that we can reach here. Um, the cost estimate for this, this system, just the uh, materials alone, is $630,000. If we get 30% tax credits, the cost to the project is 462,000. And again, because this is a family um, property, it's a walk-up, which is not necessarily as conducive to master meeting, metering, they're proposing tenant paid utilities. That does not necessarily mean that they pay off, you know, we still adjust their rent, it's still the max line tech rent takes into account a utility allowance. So it's not that they pay more, but it just comes from their utility bill rather than ours. Um, Molly, so the 211 kilowatt is the most you can do. Why? Because you can't capitalize any more than that? Because it looks like you've got some roof left. Um, we do. There are a lot of moving factors on this, including what other systems they have to put on the roof. They've not show, they're not showing here yet. We're pretty still earlier in design. Um, and also, they are trying to maximize the north facing their slanted roofs. It's not a flat top roof like Village Place. Um, so they have to work with Got it. directions as well. Um, so what's interesting in new builds is the bottom line is if the developer pays, in this case after tax credits, upwards of $400,000 to put solar PV on this, they never realize the benefit of it. Because the tenants pay the utilities, the tenants receive the, the, the benefit, which in a perfect world is wonderful, but that means that the developers are never getting their money back for it, and it's just an added cost that they already have gap funds, and unless there's gap funds to come and fill it, it is just not much incentive for a developer to do this on a light tech project. Um, so, so they don't want to. They don't generally don't want to, um, because most of them can't afford to. With a light tech, you just don't have enough money to afford it. Your margins are. Right. They already have gaps. Um, so this would just deepen the gap. So unless grant fund comes in, grant funds come in, or a partnership comes in um, to help offset that cost, you likely won't see it, which is why I think Chapa was looking at us and saying, you really? You're, you're really going to do that? And we said yes, um, because we have more, well, with, being the, with the city being involved and having other goals and and um, objectives that helps. So, who are the potential partners? I mean, because of the of the load management aspect of the thing, with PRPA or LPC, the enterprise would be potential partners. Yeah, perfect segue. Yeah. So we talked to PRPA for a period of time. They are not ready to partner on this specific project. Carol's still working with them, big picture but they are not ready to partner here. 
However, LPC, we are working with them right now because they've come up with a really creative idea that our developer is way on board with, um, that LPC will use their funding sources to purchase, install, and own this, the PV system and lease the roof space from the developer. The developer's like, excellent. We don't have to take on the capital costs, the benefits still go to the resident, which is also great. And we get paid for it. Right. So that is months and months of ideas and brainstorming to try and come to this. Um, really, I just wanted to tell that story as we go into these budget decisions being made. Um, and it was a huge learning experience. How do you, it, you see solar coming in on LIHTC projects a lot, but it's probably more like the spoke where it's like 16%, okay, that's something, but it's not gonna, you know, it's not gonna turn the, move the needle. So the real question is, are you telling Chaffa about this so that they get the benefit of the learning experience? So yes, we will, and that was part of the conversation to say this, our world's different because we have an electric utility we're touching all of these components and we're, we're working through it collectively. And, and, and I think the other thing is really having them understand that our 100% renewable by 2030, I mean, because they also question just it being an all electric um, project. And, and, you know, God, but yeah, when we get through with them, we're going to use this. This will be a model that I think we'll take to them. Probably want to talk about it. And just more generally in CML and some other things because this is different. You know, as I was talking to David about this, you know, another way to kind of take the same concept is to work with the developer where if they wanted to front the cash and they wanted something back, find a way over time where you have a contract with the developer and the electric utility and where based on energy coming in and out and how they can capitalize it where we may pay them on an increment over time to kind of create another avenue to get them to invest in solar. But that's a much more complicated set of circumstances. Well, I would say good on you for pushing yourself on this. It would be real easy to say it's too hard. It requires too much thinking or too much risk or whatever. Uh, that's, a, that's a credit to it. This unit in which to and this area generally, um, this is more of a city thing, but there's some large groups that are interested in solar as well, potentially as much as a megawatt solar generation in the area. And so this is another one of those R&D facilities in terms of the battery storage of the substations, because we really have the ability I think as we look over time with you know that the conversations we're having with this large facility, this project, the power station, the Hearthstone and Large, and even moments at Centennial to, to really get creative on um, distributed energy and how we approach it in sectors of our community. Yeah. Is, so this is part of a much broader conversation. Commissioner um Doggo Farm, I saw you got up, you were unmuted for a moment. Did you have a comment? No. Okay. <laughs> it sounds amazing. There's a lot of points where it could have very easily said we have to stop, but we'll just keep finding creative ways. So, so no, no questions up for tonight. It was just I mean, that's a testament to everybody seeing this room on the team and the broader team from LPC. And, you know, that, that's the cool thing about uh, the staff and this or organization is that um, I think the harder it gets, the more they engage. And um, no is absolutely the last possible answer that, that they come to me with. And, and it's with pain when I think when they come to me and go, we can't do this. And so. I just want to say that so you all know that the, the caliber of folks that we have in this organization, um, they're, they're leading in so many ways. It's, it's amazing to be part of that group and work with them. 
Thank you for the presentation. High fives all around. Pardon? High fives all around. Yes. Aaron, would you like to correct report? Yeah. So we're going to turn it over to them. One of the things I did want to update you on is, so as you know, in turn, we were ha um, on, the, on the housing choice voucher program. Um, you know, when, when individuals have circumstances that change, whether that's people get jobs and they don't report it, or uh, in, you know, income increases in some way, or they have more people that move in with them, um, and then we catch it. Uh, we obviously have an obligation to HUD to make sure that they're paying the appropriate rents, and in these cases, and in, in most cases here, they owe us um, a large sum of money as we're moving through that process. Um, about a year and a half ago, uh, you all granted us the ability to um, enter into payment arrangements with many of these folks. Um, I'm telling you this because, you know, we're at the point where people were paying and then people, and this gets to the other conversation. And, and now we're, we're seeing people aren't paying anymore. Um, and, and so uh, we're, we're at the point now where when we sign those agreements, I, I personally sit down with them and say, here's what I expect, here's what I need you to do. Here's what you need to make these payments on a regular basis. We, we are a little flexible if they come and communicate with us in terms of not being able to pay it and you know reworking it as long as they're continuing. So I've had examples where somebody was up to date, situation changed, we restructured the arrangements. But they were paying, they just got behind because of the life circumstances and, and, and were up front with it. We are having people that just stop paying. And, and so, just to make the board aware, I wanted you all to know that on those cases, I'm now saying we were very clear in our expectation. We told you what we needed you to do. You have not done that. And we can't continue to um, continue this approach anymore because you're so far behind and you're refusing to pay. And so, it is highly possible that it's highly likely that you all may get some people coming to you all. Um, saying that we're not working with them, but I think we have enough evidence in these cases to show how far we've gone to do this, and we still have to uphold our obligation to HUD. So ultimately, eviction is for you to... Well, in some cases, yes, or in some cases, they just don't have the voucher, and they have to um, come up with the additional Lose money. The you know, and, and we're seeing cases where they're not paying us, but they're also not even paying the landlord what they're supposed to be you know, the difference in that cost. And and so they have two things. If they get a payment arrangement with us, they have to pay us 200 bucks a month, $300 a month. Um, in that conversation, we do talk about what's your income, you know, is it three years, is it five years trying to do it? They also have many cases an obligation to pay a landlord. What we're finding is they're not paying any of it. And so it's likely they're already going through eviction with their landlord, and, and then we have this other issue. And so I think I have two or three coming where over the last week the answer is we're done. And I just wanted to give you all a heads up so you're not surprised. Um, it's unfortunate, but I think we, we have our obligations to HUD and, and to everyone and holding to um, our program. Um, so, at the moment, we are at about sixty-six thousand, um, and fifty-nine thousand of that is from past two tenants that are currently working through the collection process, making sure we're doing our due diligence to send the three letters out before we send them to collections. Um, so, currently, our current tenant balances is about nine thousand dollars. So that's way better than we've ever been before. Um, we've sent approximately about three hundred seventy-five thousand dollars to collections. We have seen nothing come back. Um, we finally, I think, had our first one this last month. Reach out to Lisa. We had to tell her we can't talk to them. We have to talk to the collection agency. This ones that hits that, but that's the first one we've actually even seen come back or, or have a response probably because they're getting. 
we've written off about twelve thousand dollars, and that was mainly due to tenants that had passed away. Um, and there's just no <laughs> obligation past that. It's cleaning services, um, that type of stuff, cleaning unit that has to happen after after those situations. So we're definitely much stronger in our AR than we've ever been before. We have practices in place to send out the letters and do our due diligence and send it to collections. But I don't know. I know collections has the law is that they have six years that they can continue to collect, but most of it will never see on anybody's credit report because it's mainly fee related. So, so unless we need judgments um, or unless we have rent that they owe, I think the rent can go um, on their credit report, but no fees can. So, so I just have a question because you said um, you said the, did you say three day letter when you sent it? Yes, yeah, so we do three letters. We do we do okay. one um, thirty days as we collect the cleaning charges and stuff. Yeah, we do one at sixty, oh, and then we do oh a final one at ninety to seven hundred percent oh. collections. This is our final. Ooh, that's a lot of grace. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we're, we're hoping that one of the things that we'd like to do is is make it as a kind of an incentive um, for our property managers that if they can get something set up in that 90 day period, we haven't got it set up yet, but if they can get a payment plan and the money's coming in, why not give those property managers the cut that we would be giving the collection agency if they can actually get the money so that is That's definitely huge. been talks we just mm -hmm. haven't implemented it. Ooh, trying to get that. the practices in place first so um so then maybe that may be incentive to actually sure well, and try and keep that connection with the resident at move out and really push for that new address new contact and mm -hmm. the only thing about the 90 day for me and i know you said there are new laws is that you know we're at a deficit, right? And so as far as units and for people to move and need spaces and then we hold in this unit, if they're not gonna pay, they're not gonna pay, right? Oh, we're not, oh, I say my 90 days is like they've already left. Oh, they already left. Yeah. Oh, okay, already that's not so okay. Sorry, 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 sorry. Yeah, yeah okay. ours, they've already left, so we try, okay. we try to do a 60-day letter, 60-day letter, 90-day letter. Okay. That's, I don't know what, but evictions are probably taking about three months now mm -hmm. because of the okay. laws, yeah, or more. Okay. So but you could I, accumulate. On that note, though, we're not letting them grow to the level that they were growing before. Before we're going into the world of, you know, the notice to vacate. 13,000, 15,000. Yeah, right. so we're, we're dealing with it on the front end, but it still takes a while. Yeah. But yeah, before, I guess when, right when we were taking it over, there were some huge balances of where they were allowing them to go, what, seven, eight months? Yeah. Yeah, and then by then they can't catch up. Right. They can't catch up. Um, as financials, I, I won't go into detail on any of them, but um, if you guys have any questions, we are seeing, like, based on budget, our vacancies are high. Um, but our expenditures haven't hit a point where we're in a negative or a loss situation. So um, we're still staying steady pretty much within our budget um, and not going over those. Part of that is because uh, when we budget, we don't include our um, tenant base vouchers. So if you have like some properties, we have 19 tenant base vouchers at one property, but those tenant, those tenant base vouchers go with the tenant. So we don't want to budget for those funds. But if they stay there the entire year, we're obviously going to have more revenue than was um, essentially budgeted. So even if our vacancies spike, that money kind of cushions it in the end. Um, we talked about that when we presented the budget. That's our hedging strategy. Do we know why vacancies are high? Is it because of damages or is it they're not so occupied. I'm going through some of that. Yes. Oh, thank you. And, and some of it is also the 60% units. We're having a hard time mm -hmm. just even housing those 60%. Finding somebody that can afford the 60% units, um, that's been a big struggle, especially at Canada. Well, that, and that was the part of the question that I wanted to have is that people can't afford them. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, and that's, 
That's the change. I mean, when you look at the market studies that we're seeing, uh, they're saying we're oversaturated at 60% AMI. And especially for seniors, if they're on fixed incomes, the 60% is way out of range. Mm -hmm. and, and so what happened is, is when they were taking these through the tra tax credit world, they were saying, um, we have 30, 40, 50, but they were, our chunk is at 60. Mm -hmm. And for older adults on fixed incomes. There um, aren't many who can afford it. Um, yeah. So, there's nothing we can do about that it's because it seems dumb that if we could rent them at 40 percent but we are forced by rules to keep them sitting vacant at 60 percent that's you know i think we'd you be have doing to, better i think you have to weigh it because we had that situation with field village place where they were bringing people in that weren't mm -hmm. at those levels and then we weren't making enough money to survive so there's there's a there's a balance that you have to because once you put that person in there then they're in there under that percentage for as long as they're there mm -hmm. so you know it's not like it just you can't kick them out because <laughs> you need the money to come in so i think that's that's the struggle it's is finding out we what we did start doing which we i don't think we were doing very good before is that now once we reach a point we say we don't have to go off our waiting list we've already exhausted our waiting list and it's collapsed the market Let's see if there's anybody out there in the market getting the newspapers, get it at other agencies to bring people in that can't afford that piece. I think there is a point where when we get some time to think about, again, a, a different hedging strategy to say, if you have X percentage of units, you know, if you have 20 units, um, and you have to look at this on property by property. So if we have a lot of vacancies and it's really killing us, we would probably want to look at it and go, what's the risk of saying we want to bring a 50 into a 60? You can't do that on all of them. And so there's a lot of nuances in this, but I think there's a way to try to do what they were doing at Village Place that created the problem, but not necessarily have the same magnitude of problem. But we just haven't had time to. I think we've talked about it a few times, but we haven't had time to. And some funding sources we really can't. Right. You know, if it's got home funds, you don't want to mm -hmm. be putting anything other than the actual percentage uh, for that group. So. Well, we've heard you say, I think, that we're we're not overbuilt necessarily, but we don't need a whole lot more sixty percent. Correct. Right. And this is consistent with that message we've been hearing. And that's why average income is becoming a big. Yeah. Um, so I'll move on and to the, the vouchers. Um, so um, the vouchers right now, what we're going to see based on our two-year tool is that at the end of 2023, we'll probably be at 419 vouchers. However, by the end of 2024, we're going to have to reduce our vouchers to about 379. Part of that is because of the increase in the fair market rents. So the increase in the fair market rents were almost $150 to $200 a month. When you add that to 400 vouchers over a year, if HUD doesn't give us more money, which we just have to go off what we think they're going to give us next year based on the two year tool they give us, that we're just going to have to start sliding our vouchers down because people are going to, landlords are going to increase their rents. Therefore, those vouchers are going to go up. So as we start to lose vouchers, or not lose vouchers, as people start to come off, we won't be able to um, put that voucher back. And we're also going to see, we're going to have to start reducing so we can add the village place PDB voucher stuff that will work as well. So, are we having any people porting in their vouchers? We do. We have about, I think, eight or nine that have ported in and we haven't absorbed them just because it's it, When we got the big chunk of money this last year, we absorbed everybody we had just so that we could actually start venturing up. Um, but right now we're not absorbing at the moment. Now if HUD gives us more money, it might be just good because we'll get more admin. Mm -hmm. 
when we absorb as well. But right now we're not absorbing. It's probably time to start the political conversations with um, Congressman Hughes um, and our and our senators because I think it was hard <coughs> for us to when we started this to have a conversation because of performance wasn't there. I think we can very clearly demonstrate the performance now, and I think we're going to have to start pulling the political levers to try to get more funding for HUD, and that'll be something we'll be bringing back to the, to the board and the council. Especially when we get the voluntary compliance agreement checked off and some of these other, I mean, those were headwinds coming into this. We had a voluntary compliance agreement, they weren't fully vouchering up. They had a lot of headwinds. I think we're, we're starting to be neutral. Uh, and I think there's some tailwinds in our future. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're, we're probably getting right to that conversation. And we're ho I'm hoping that because they increase these fair market rents so much, that they're expecting to increase people's budgets to accommodate that request. Because if they don't, everybody's going to have to lose vouchers. So, but we won't usually know that until March of 2024. Mm -hmm. That's our calculation. Which is about good timing for us. <laughs> and this will probably be one at NLC where I, I will probably go for a little bit with you all, especially when you get some meetings. Okay. That's NLC. National cities. cities. But we meet with, our, we meet with our, our reps and our senators and stuff. So. Yeah, that's probably a good time. Yeah. Oh, well, I know, but it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's okay. So that's, that's my report in a nutshell. Thank you. Thank you. All right. <coughs> Occupancy. Occupancy. So, um, ended October about 96% occupied of us for our units overall. Um, just break down some of the vacancy. Aspen Meadows <coughs> we had five vacants. One did move in, three are down for meth. Two of those are light meth contamination. So, I have contractors walking this week. Since we, I think both of them just need a bathroom rebuilt and one needs a laundry room rebuilt. So hoping that those will go pretty quickly to get those units online by the first of the year. The other one is the one that's been down for almost two years. Um, drywall's going in, air ducts going in. Um, that's the one we partnered with Habitat and having their contractors come help us. Well, this is a map. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. 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 Why not the right choice of work? <laughs> 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 yeah. Um, Doug Spite ran across a company that's been doing some work in Pueblo, and um, they have worked with the Pueblo Housing Authority um, and, and various other housing groups in the southern part of the state. And, and so we met with them because they are, have basically developed a process where up to 150, is it 150? It's between the 2000s. Or 2000s. Something about it. anyway, they actually don't have required to be demoed. Um, now, so the cost of the remediation is more equivalent to uh, the de the total demo demolition cost, but what you actually lose is the rebuilding cost associated with that. So, um, right now, uh, Doug and Lisa are working to get quotes for them to work on. Um, some of the issues that we have on Lisa's property, and then some proactive cleaning on some of the city stuff just to see what the process is like. And um, if we can get clear evidence that it works, talk to people in Pueblo, we're probably going to adjust how we bid um, meth remediation so that, um, because it's not an apple and an orange, and if you look at it, it's, just, it's, not, a, it's not apples to apples, it's an apple and an orange. If you, if you look at the bid and, and how you bid it out, um, the companies can come in and say, well, here's my cost, and it'll be lower, but they end up making the demo things. 
versus they'll come in and say, here's our cost, and we can avoid the demo. Demo demolish, not yeah. demonstrate there. Yeah, demo to demolish, yes. And, um, and so we're going to be trying that out. The good part of this is that when we talk about the vacancy times that we've been dealing with on meth units, dramatically reduces that. And so you go from 12 to 15 months to maybe two months, which then helps on the financial side of getting tenants in those properties. Uh, so we're going to be evaluating that over the next month or so. And at the end of the day, if it works, I think we also have an obligation to notify the community about this new process because it's not just the housing authority dealing, dealing with its parking <coughs> homeowners. And, and so we're going to be digging into that. So it's a new methodology for remediation. <coughs> Yeah, I mean, like we've told them stories about where they tell us to remove metal ducking, and they were like, what? Why, why are they telling you to do that? And here's how we clean it, and the only ducking that, ducting that we say you have to remove is when the insulation is on the inside of it versus the outside. And they clean air conditions where you don't have to, documented evidence of not having to replace them. And who inspects after that? The make certain mm -hmm. so that they, they, they passed inspections sure. just as they would have been, been demolished and rebuilt. Mm -hmm. That's cool. So, you know, you know what you know, and you know, it's an interesting story. Mm -hmm. The guy was friends with Doug's son, who found out what Doug did and said, hey, can I meet with you? And literally they met and it's like, all right, we need to meet again. And, um, and they're actually moving to the northern front range and opening an office in Longmont. And uh, they have a strong connection to the community. They serve on boards on building affordable housing and attainable. And I asked them, is it proprietary? And they go, no, we're trying to tell everybody else how to do this, but it's just not generating the income that, you know, demolition and reconstruction generates. And the contractor. Yeah, and so, yeah, it was, a, it was an interesting learning moment for us. So a, a related question to, to remediation is, are we seeing any changes in the frequency or occur, occasions of a contamination? Residents are awakened to this and the risks of their own health and the Not the wood. That would be a yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 Few months since I've had the need to test. That's what the way it looks in the in the numbers. Yeah, exactly. I just you know, yeah. We're, we're, I think they're knowing we're using those meth detectors. We're testing them. Yeah. They, they know Sarah's out there on the sites. Oh, it's Sarah. The batteries. <laughs> 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 we're talking about it. We're bringing it up in coffee and conversations. Right. So that we're not playing around. Right. Sarah can talk about the meth detectors in there. This also reminds me, you know, one of the things in the conversation that we've come across is that in the majority of cases where you find meth, you also find fentanyl. And one of the things that this group that we're talking about also does is they provide trainings for um, our maintenance staff and others. Uh, we're going to need to do that. And we're not only on the LHA side, but on the city side, starting to really rethink how we're approaching training for math and more precisely fentanyl and asking ourselves the question, do we, do we need to start providing um, our maintenance folks, whether they're LHA, parks, with naloxone and other things, just because of information over the last three weeks that Sarah's been talking to me about, it's like, we're running into some really potentially significant life safety issues, and um, we could talk about why, but it's basically there's no consistency to how they're mixing the meth in with the, the other drugs. So you can have a pill that's perfectly fine and another one that's so high that it drops. I mean, we've seen videos of it dropping police officers. So we're gonna be organizationally engaging in that subject. Um, Doug's already started trying to figure it out. Well, I will say it was a huge conversation at NLC in Atlanta. And a lot of municipalities are dealing with this right now. Yeah. A lot. So I think for us to make sure that our people are trained, um, we 
have it on hand is crucial. Yes. <clears throat> so besides that, um, we're working through our wait list right now is a hard time. A lot of seniors do not want to move in the holidays and the cold. So, but um, we're working through the wait list. We're getting new apps every day. So it's kind of helping that we're keeping these wait lists open. So at least we're not going stagnant and we're not waiting months and having to reopen a wait list. So we have names we're calling and we're just kind of ease. For the property updates, um, it's a lot of the same stuff, but this time I decided to include some pictures because we've had a lot of fun activities going on lately. <laughs> so two pages of, um, we've done some military appreciation, pet photo ops, craft events, holiday events. It's um, The biggest <coughs> shock out of all this to me is now the suites residents are putting together their own activities. They did a Friendsgiving. Um, the manager was there and started organizing it and they took over. And they're already starting to plan their Christmas one or their uh, winter celebration at the property. The residents are pulling us all together and just asking Ruby to help them coordinate. So. And this is really the goal that you all set for us in our goal setting session about resident engagement. And this is giving you a sense and you all know what we were dealing with with the suites two years ago. So I also want to add on that um, we've done two operational things here recently. First of all, we held an operations retreat a week and a half ago um, to get the voucher team, the property team, the maintenance team, and finance all together to talk about things that crisscross over everyone and do some more micro goal setting because you have the LHA overall goals, but then we really have some um, more performance related goals that the teams wanted to set for themselves for next year. Um, so we did do that and as part of that we finally rolled out the community manager's manual. So that is in place. The community managers all have binders. Um, it is complete from front to back. So um, have a, a, sort of, a sort of related question um, talking about the suites and the new permanent a supportive housing. Um, there's a lot of confusion going on among public, and I don't want to take up a huge amount of time because I know everybody wants to get out of here, but um, people think that we have thousands of units, you know, there, there's a magazine article about a, a 900 unit tiny home village um, that somebody built. And they think, well, Longmont needs that. We wouldn't have any homeless people if we had that. And you know, and I think we may have as much as we can support of permanent supportive housing between ours and the veterans' village. And you know, yeah, you can walk around and see homeless people, but most of them have no interest. So, do do we have any information about how much of that? kind of, you know, both permanent and transitional supportive housing, a city with the size of Longmont, with Longmont's size of the, of the street population, do we have enough? Do we need more? Do we have any idea? Because um, the last thing we want is, is for people to come here because it exists. So I... We have two sources that we can rely on. It doesn't answer the question directly, but a little more indirectly. We know from our housing needs assessment that mm -hmm. are based on our current census data, so those are those that report on the census, mm -hmm. um, that our need for 30% units, mm -hmm. supportive or not, affordable at 30% units is mm -hmm. the highest need we have. We also know and that- how, how many units? Because when I read that damn thing, I can't tell. It's almost 2,000. Um, it's 2,000, 2,200 below 50%, um, and I'd have to pull it up, but the majority of that was at 30% level. Okay. Um, I don't know where you get that out of that report. It's also building on CDBG data that we've been pulling for a long time to demonstrate needs every five years. It's kind of conglomerating it together. Um, the second thing we know is that the same developer that did Zinnia, is doing Zinnia, mm -hmm. is doing Bluebird Boulder, which is, um, I 
can't remember how many units. I think it's smaller than Zinnia. 40. I'm sorry? 40. 40, mm -hmm. thanks. Um, they are in lease up right now because they plan to be leased up by January, I think, and they're almost there. And so they have leased up all 40 of those units in the last, what, three months? Mm -hmm. um, and so we know that that is soaking up a lot of those coming out of coordinated entry through HSBC. Uh -huh. um, but they're obviously there to be soaked up in three, three months. Um, and so then all the lessons that they're learning in that lease up, we're going to take and learn in Zinnia. But we do know those two things, that it's only taken that long to lease up that building. <coughs> um, and we know the affordability that we need. Right. So, uh, yeah. And so I get, uh, so Zinnia is what, 60? 55. 55. And <coughs> there's a big gap between that and thousands. So, I mean, does that mean that, that we ought to be looking at building 900 units of so I think our coordinated entry and HSBC data would tell us the most on that. We'd have to pull the What's the, the, for that. the number we written uh, over the point in well, time? Well, the point in time, so the, the issue with those numbers, I mean, not saying yeah. that they're not legit, but it, we did it and then, you know, it's cold. Yeah. You yeah. know, the weather dependent, folks not being around. Right. Um, so I, I don't know that number off the top of my head. I believe it was it was a lower than what what El Alberto what we all expected. I think it, he said we we got eighty. And I think that's not with what you all were saying, one hundred and fifty ish mm -hmm. mm -hmm. unhoused, and then obviously of that who want, who's resistant. willing. I mean, and so yeah. you, you start pulling down into it. The other component to it is. What we've learned in the suites and what we've corrected for in Zinnia and what you all approved in the budgets mm -hmm. is it's not as simple as just building the units. Right. I, I the guess all of that. Supportive services, and, and that's the hardest ones to solve. Sure. And, and all of that is easy to understand. What is not easy to understand is where the other 900, 2,000 people coming from if we've got a few hundred people on the streets or are less than a hundred from that last point in time. But in cars. We have residents and we have issues with having an authorized their kids living in their apartment because the kids are homeless sleeping in the cars and during the winter they're coming into the units. Mm -hmm. So I we probably have about ten of those issues yeah. is this winter alone. Right. So yeah, so again, how 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 are those counted? You know, if, if it's young people living in their parents' basement. In my mind, they're housed. That's so. It's we do have data from HSBC of those that go through the coordinated entry system. Mm -hmm. We also know that generally nationwide, ten percent of homelessness is visible. Ninety percent of it is this, and that is going to be ninety percent feasibly mm -hmm. of the applicants that come in for um, for these first steps for housing. So this is an assumption based it's, on nationwide data. The the ninety to ten. But that is because that's incredibly difficult to quantify. Yeah. Um, but we do have HSBC data, and that's the best that we have. Plus, we know what we see on the wait list on and the Bluebird situation. Mm -hmm. um, but it's kind of putting all the pieces all together. It's very complex. And I would also say, just because you need a thirty percent unit doesn't mean that you're necessarily unhoused. And so when Molly talks about needing. You know, two thousand under fifty percent AMI, and the majority of those are probably even thirty. Those are people that, when I give you the onion analogy, you know, you have traditionally unhoused, you have marginally housed, you have people who are living with friends and family. That it's it's the aggregate that controls <coughs> that number. Technically, they may be housed, living with friends, but you know, people people with no income living in houses that they own and can't afford to maintain and they're about to fall out of them because the house becomes uninhabitable. Or, or or have income, they just can't afford to pay more than what a thirty percent unit is. And and, and I think that's how much is a thirty percent unit? Uh, do you know what's your thirty percent line type rent on just a one bedroom? Is 7.5. Yeah. When we were 
before the pandemic, when we were in this more inclusive conversation about housing needs, not just about the homeless population, but that was part of it. Sure. And we got we started to get clear on how we segment that population from seniors or couch surfing and you know what do we know about an aging population to, to men and women looking who are have been abused and need a safe safe shelter or the equivalent to moms and dads and families living in cars to our veterans uh, to the homeless population how that segments in, in, in my mind at that time we were headed towards uh, greater clarity on what's the what are the policy considerations because the housing options or the, the solutions to the, to the problems or challenges people are facing are going to be different for every one of those segments. So for somebody to say we have we need 900 tiny homes, I, and I, I think the, the question about data is an important one. Um, but I, I think you got to take a step back and before you talk about housing type and housing numbers, mm -hmm. is what do those segments of the population need? And what are the options that we have available to be responsive to those segments? That's, for me, that's the starting place. And we never, I know Alberto did a report, cobbled together, you know, that, that conversation, but but we never finished it, in my opinion. So we, it, we, you know, and I, I, I thought a number of times how useful it would have been mm -hmm. in this conversation, even right now, to say, could we go back to that? Because it's, it, 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 without, without segmenting the population, it's hard to have a meaningful conversation about housing types or numbers. Or it is. Um, and, and you know what, what what's happening is, is that you're getting accusations from the public. Mm -hmm. you know, why doesn't Longmont have anything like this? Well, you know, I don't even know whether Longmont needs anything like this. Um, Part of the answer to that is we have just recently got the county to agree to share the data with us, and so part of the challenge of that was. They would give you cuts of data. We didn't know where we were duplicating. It was about a month or two. Whenever I lost my mind on a meeting. Um, it was what, three months ago? <laughs> I, was just, I, was just, I was just meeting Bob Sandy and just lost it. They now have an, are working to sharing the data, and that's actually, I think, going to give us more clarity on what we're seeing because we can we can actually do our own analysis on it. Have we finished that work, Carol, knowing what data mm -hmm. or which data are most useful at what time and to be used in what ways? That that work would have really informed or even helped create the questions we might be asking right. relative to the segments of the population. And I just think it's unfortunate there's all kinds of reasons we didn't, you know, we didn't get as far with that conversation as I thought we were going to get, and the pandemic had a lot to do with it. Sure. But I do think, um, you know, Marsha's question is is one of those. I think I think it's in the context of better information about segments, about about anticipating or projecting. The point in time study is is a pretty weak, unreliable, you know, it's a data point on a night. Which doesn't give you much. So. Right, and it's the it's the worst of the worst yeah. in terms of people who have no resources. That there's not even anybody that will let you sleep on their porch. Um, well, and I think but we're going to get so now with the county's data, we can look at what Zach and Sarah and the group are working on with our lead and or was it lead, lead. And lead that we repurposed on the outreach side. Mm -hmm. We can now look at what Alberto's generating to, to start getting that view. It was impossible without that county data set because that was the HSBC data set. And what's their reason for not wanting to share that? It, there's a lot of reasons around it, but uh, they're modeling out of how the federal data set is treated, particularly when you with law enforcement, that the federal data set they don't want a law enforcement tool for the populations because they're trying to serve the populations the population that we want. So they, they don't want to share it because they might arrest somebody based on what they share. Yeah, because they're not going to want to share their information if they know that it's going to go to law enforcement. So they're modeling it off of the, how a federal data set has been treated. This there's a lot of reasons why this one should should or could be treated differently and uh, led to their, uh, yeah, here's the, yeah. 
bottom line here is the thing. We, we, it's our data that we own it. It's like, by damn, you do. We're paying money into it. We should have access to it. And there's some philosophical opinions in this about, well, we don't want Sarah to see it. Well, in our case, we have Lead and Core that's servicing this part of the community. You're automatically assuming that we're going to use it for nefarious purposes so we can go round people up and arrest them. Is this coming from commissioners? This is staff. Are they hearing that from commissioners? Well, it's resolved now. Yeah. And I'll just be frank, because you're likely to hear it. I said, what you're, I think when I really triggered it, Sam's <laughs> laughing. It was really frustrating. I said, basically, what you're doing is dismantling the collaboration that we've tried to achieve because you're not giving us any value to this. And if we can't get it, I'm prepared to go to our council and say, this isn't working because we're not sharing data. And I think that's a pretty close paraphrasing of what I said, I believe. But it, 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 was, it was several months ago. So, yeah. um, so basically, I was ready to say we're out of the collaborative if you're not going to share your data. You know, Harold, I'm just filled with admiration because it's been yeah. an unfulfilled desire and ambition of mine to get to a point where I could lose my mind in a meeting with impunity. Um, so <laughs> congratulations <laughs> on reaching that point. That was nice. <laughs> I was, that was really nice, wasn't it? He was like, that was three months ago. And it needed someone to focus because I think there's just too many people and it was uh, too great an opportunity to dance around the issue and never actually touch the middle mm-hmm. and then end the meeting without having resolved anything. Uh, so I believe it was okay. it's, uh, mm-hmm. touched the wide wire for the Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Lisa, are you, I mean, any other, did you want to say? Okay. Who needs next? Okay, all right. Um, just a few updates. Uh, I plan, our calls for service have been um, low, steady. Um, I plan next month to give an overall maybe the last few year, probably three year comparison of calls for service to everyone and go into that a little bit um, for the end of the year. Um, let's see, meth detectors. We met with the gentleman from New Zealand. He came to the U.S. and uh, had, a, I thought, a great meeting with him. He brought us another, um, they've changed the platform on them so they're not using lithium batteries anymore. They're using regular alkaline batteries. They did bring us one of those, and we are currently testing that one um, in one of our hot units at the suites. Um, I did already replace the batteries. Yeah, so the alkaline batteries are going to take a lot, um, or you're going to have to replace well, them. Well, we're days, told right? that, that we're told that they they will last up to fourteen months. Mm. That's what we're told. Um, so stay tuned. Um, we are on the meth piece as well. We started working on um, documents for moving forward with these meth detectors with staff. So we're, we're working on that as well with the attorneys. And that's about it for the meth detectors. We're um, in talking to it. We want to move into the next phase of the analysis. And so we're looking to get 28, 28. that we're going to put actually in city restaurants. Um, and before we step into to housing. That's tying into the work that Doug is doing with the remediation company. So we're gonna be we're gonna bring them in, be very selective of we want to clean half of the restrooms, we want to not clean half. We want to put these in, start seeing how they work in a clean unit and an unclean unit. Um, there are certain facilities that we are cleaning. Um, Roosevelt Built, uh, Rose, uh, the memorial building, um, and then start learning through what that data looks like and then connecting it to if it goes off and bringing in a hygienist, doing the test to, to get, you know, if it reads this, it corresponds with this. Um, 
the the thing you'll see is they don't have the metal detector stickers on them anymore. We're actually going to put something on the doorway when you go in that says metal detectors are in use. Um, they're finding in New Zealand that's actually as much of a deterrent as anything else. And um, the battery thing, you know, I think you talked to somebody where they la they lasted like four years, <coughs> and so. The, that's the learning moment is, is it the cell system that's doing this? It, it, it could be the carrier, so it has to hook to the carrier, and I think that was with the new device, the, the, the hiccup initially. Um, so we're, we're problem solving as we go. Isn't it somewhat like a, a uh, fire sort of mm -hmm. alarm sort of thing? Because people every six months would change mm -hmm. up. I mean, before we had lithium batteries, we certainly yeah, don't put lithium in so. <laughs> so it, it's, it is the same, it has a gap sensor in it, and it's, and it's essentially works the same. As your smoke detector. Mm -hmm. So do they make a loud noise, or do they just alert the police? No, 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 they, depending on who's, so in the, the one in the bathrooms, we're limiting <coughs> access, so it'll alert Sarah, Doug, Derek, and that's it. Yeah. So it's email alerts. What about you know, what saying? They won't hardwire. We we ask that question, and um, a lot of it's due to well that, and they they want a full tamper proof like system. So it, it basically has a tilt alert. Like if you take if someone were to take it off a wall, if someone were to cover it with a bag, um, there's there's mechanisms set within the the alarm itself. But a CO two detector has a Hardwire, I mean, basically not hardwire, but it plugs into the wall and it has battery on it. Yeah, so um, honestly, the answer is the market's not there for, for that based on the tampering because you want to mount them up. Oh, right. Mm -hmm. And and that that's part of the issue. It's not like you can plug it into the socket in the wall. Right. Um, and right now the market to purchase these is for hotels and other things. And so the battery aspect of it is very clear. They did say to us that, you know, as we work with them, they will look at a hardwired component for new construction. Um, and what else did this, oh, a different SIM card function. You know, so if we come in and say, we're ready to order 300 of these, they will develop the SIM card function that we need to work with the city's LTP system. Obviously, they're not going to do that for 10 or 20. Um, but Sarah's their R&D person. <laughs> yeah. I mean, really. So they yes. don't have a lot of municipal customer base. It's, it's growing. So we know that um, Element has talked to them. Um, Jeffco. Jeffco. Um, they've got... They have several clients here in Colorado, and they, they haven't specifically disclosed them, but... Do we get any break after after uh, we uh, uh, use them and they get our data and they are able to then say, hey, look, in this world, uh, in these communities, do we get some sort of uh, first, first servers trip break? Yeah, we 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 got it. That. We, we, yeah, really good. I was hoping that. That's great. Any other questions on meth detectors? <laughs> <laughs> um, last, uh, a few more things. So the fire drills at the senior communities we did have to cancel due to the weather when we had them planned. So we're hoping for a good day sometime before spring. You know, the residents definitely understood. Um, and last but not least, um, uh, kudos out to city staff, LHA staff, um, for basically working, uh, putting a lot of time in to get a woman that's living at the suites currently, she's on the eviction docket for Friday, she made some poor choices. Um, she's been a big drain to public safety through, for several years, and a big drain on LHA staff. Um, we were able to get a security deposit negotiated down from $1,900 to $300. Thank you to Tracy. And she has picked a senior community in Lafayette, and I drove first. Well, and then I was able to get the $300 from 
Chief Satter's um, citizen fund that he had at his club. Um, we got that today. I handed it to the manager, and uh, so now she was she's not going to be living in her car because we were getting very close to her being homeless. So that was a big positive win for us uh, all, including her. So. Tracy to negotiate for you. <laughs> <laughs> that's all I have unless anyone has questions. Now I was actually going to use that example. What a lot of people don't see is that's the work we're doing on a daily basis. And, and you know, again, it's just another example. Yes, we go through eviction. Yes, we do this. All of this stuff occurs before we ever get to the point where we're like, this is what we have to do. And, and that doesn't get out a lot, but I'm glad you said that because I was going to bring it up. And then I know, um, just to add to that a little bit, there's, you know, Lisa has several constraints, you know, and I know that the system well enough now, um, working in the housing industry for so long, that I know that she has, she absolutely, we have to do what we need to do as far as lease violations, posting, eviction, but. Um, we were able in this situation to really help this person out. Um, it feels it feels great, you know, to make sure that she's not going to be living on our streets. So, well, thank you, thank you all for what you do. It matters and means a lot. So yeah, yeah. we will be assured after this meeting. Yes, think about it, uh, Commissioner Waters, when you were on LA J board. Well, this this word it, it's come so far. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It is. Uh, yeah. It, there's no comparison. Um, Thank you for all of your support over the years. Yes, Before yes. all of us even. Yes. It's been time work. It's worth the time and effort. And I've been a bit cold as well. So work is too important, and the beneficiaries are too numerous uh, to not stay the course. So. Um, we did find one thing that was quite funny at our retreat that none of us like phone for communication. <laughs> nobody wanted to make phone calls. Most, nobody wanted to make phone calls. We did we a lot it, of yeah. um, team building and communication exercises and stuff like that to get everybody crossing over the you know no silos allowed kind of thing. But you need the phone and you need to talk not to have the silos. They want to walk over and talk in person. <laughs> yeah. yeah. In my, in my world, yeah. I'm one of the few people in my family or my circle of friends who actually uses a phone to talk to somebody. Mm -hmm. Generally, they use it for everything else. Mm -hmm. but well, and, and, and that means you communicate like a boomer. So I do. we got that <laughs> survey. Did everybody take that survey about how you communicate? I got mm -hmm. those. I think it was, yeah, it came, it came to council. Yeah. We may have been in one of those delete this email kind of emails, but, um, but it turned out to be a really interesting. Marsh, I was the prototype for boomers. That's <laughs> 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 what it is. Yeah, I don't know. Well, I communicate like a millennial, so yeah. All right, any other commissioner comments? Any commissioners, anything to say? Oh, yeah, I just, I do. Carol, I, I handed you that email the other night. Tuesday night from home ahead. Uh, uh, Mary Gaylord's been trying to connect with you two. Did you want to do that? I, I, we, I don't want to. We got it set. Mm -hmm. Okay. Erica, Erica got it and she set it up. I think it, I don't know if we were getting it or not getting the email. Um, I will admit I got it and I said I will get right back to you and I've been delayed. Like, but you got a lot it's of set up. On your plate. It's just, if I, did, I don't want to. Push that they've come back to me a couple of times to say, uh, you know, what about this? And I said, no, we need to send right. another email and and because uh, I know we're interested. So, yeah. well, Erica has a mm -hmm. terrific thank you. I move your second. All right, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Good night.